Our call to confession this morning comes from Matthew 28. We'll read 16 and 17. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mount to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. In verse 17, there are two responses that are presented to the risen Christ. On the one hand, you have the 11 disciples gathered together, and when they see the Lord and their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, resurrected from the dead, they worship him. On the other hand, you have others who are gathered there that when they see Jesus Christ risen from the dead, doubt what they are seeing. Another translation might be hesitate. They hesitate because of what they see. Now, as we think about this, thinking about doubting the resurrection, if I can say this, doesn't seem that unusual to us today. Right? Here we are, 2,000 plus years separated from that event, and there is no one living on the earth today that could give us kind of a verbal eyewitness testimony to what they saw that day. So if somebody came in and said, well, I doubt that Jesus was raised from the dead, we might have reason to believe that. What, what's more difficult to believe is that people standing there, seeing this Jesus who was publicly crucified before the city, risen, alive, bodily resurrected, and doubting what they are seeing seems all the more unbelievable. Uh, we, we wonder, how is this even possible? How could you look at this and how could any sense of doubt or hesitation come into your heart? And while I don't have all the answers as to why they doubt it, I think at least in part, maybe large part, it's due to the hardness of heart. It, it, it's due to the way that sin so effectively, so comprehensively hardens the human heart and blinds it even to what is right in front of their eyes. Sin is so destructive that even though these people are seeing Jesus standing right in front of them, out of the grave and alive, they doubt what they actually see. Now again, as we think about this, there might be some gathered with us today who doubt the resurrection. Some people who just don't think people come back from the dead. And I've got to be honest, it, it, is, it is rather unusual for people to come back from the dead. In fact, I would argue that's what makes it so miraculous is that Jesus did that which is extremely unusual. He came back from the grave. And while we don't have living on this earth eyewitness testimony to it, we do have written eyewitness testimony which is living and active and is speaking to us today declaring that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Those 11 who saw this and worshipped him went on to give their lives to proclaim the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in just a short amount of time after this point, Christians were accused of being those who had turned the world upside down. Now, you don't go turn the world upside down for a lie. You don't go turn the world upside down for something that did not happen. But when something so radical so life-changing, so miraculously unusual happens, like Jesus Christ coming back from the dead. Well, that is life-changing. That is transforming. That you cannot be the same after you witness that and after you see that. So this morning, as we come before Christ to worship the risen Christ. And as we've already been encouraged this morning at the baptism, that oftentimes we need to repent of our imperfect rep repentance, let us come again before the Lord. Let us humbly bow our knee before the Lord. Let us join in confessing that he is raised from the dead and he is worthy of all of our worship, honor, praise, and glory. And let us repent of the times when we are more hesitant than we should be in worshiping our risen Lord and Savior. So if you're able this morning, I ask that you please kneel with me as we confess our sins. This morning as we gather together to uh, celebrate uniquely or, or maybe more specifically like intensely the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's, I think it's good for us to remember that every Sunday or every Lord's Day that we gather together, that is exactly what we are celebrating. We are celebrating every Lord's Day that Christ is no longer in the grave, that he is alive, 
that our Lord and Savior sits at the right hand of the Father and reigns over all creation. Now, this morning, uh, in, maybe in recognition of the unusual uh, nature of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, I want to do something slightly unusual for myself. That is, I want to look at two different passages of Scripture this morning. If you look at your bulletin, uh, it says that we're going to be in John 11, which was just read for us, and 1 Corinthians 15. And this is not typical, uh, so I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to John 11 right now. That's where we'll begin, and we'll kind of work through that a little bit, and then shift from John 11 over to 1 Corinthians 15. And in doing so, what I want to do this morning is I want to consider, uh, on the first hand from John 11, the certainty uh, of death, the finality of death, the, the, uh, just the, 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 the reality of death. And then bridging from what Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life, move into 1 Corinthians 15 and consider how Paul unpacks that reality. How, how he unpacks the reality of that, the hope of that truth for us, the church. Um, and so it's my hope that when we are finished this morning, we will be rejoicing all the more that Christ Jesus is indeed risen from the grave and in that we have every single reason to be hopeful this morning. So let's look at John 11 together first. Uh, when we look at John 11, we are looking at the story or the event, I should say, of the raising of Lazarus. And, and what I want to do uh, in particular is focus on the interaction between Jesus and Martha, that, that conversation that Jesus and Martha have, and, and understand from that really uh, the certainty, the finality of death. And I don't say that assuming that you have uh, no idea or, or thought or realization that death is final and, and death is certain. I'm not, I, I hope I'm not, <laughs> hope I'm not ruining the end for anybody right here. Like everybody, you know, you're going to die. Sorry. That's a spoiler alert there for your life. Um, but it is good for us, I think, time and time, to, time, and time again, to, to be reminded of, of things, uh, to have them brought again before us afresh, to kind of sit under that, to see it, and, and to deal with it once again. We are, we are by nature, uh, forgetful people. Uh, some of us are better at remembering things than others, but the truth of the matter is that we all tend to forget, and it's good for us to be reminded again that death is certain, that death is final, that every man, woman, and child will eventually die die. So as we come into John 11, uh, the story of Lazarus, or the raising of Lazarus, is probably one of the most well-known uh, stories or events that takes place in the Bible, and certainly it's a pivotal event in the Gospel of John. As John is unpacking the reality of who Jesus is, the Son of God, uh, the Word made flesh, this is pivotal, this is, this is a massive point in his argument about who Jesus is. Uh, part of the, maybe the, I don't want to say notoriety, but the fame of this event centers around what Jesus does, right? He raises Lazarus from the grave, right? Move the stone away. He calls him out of the tomb. Certainly that, that, that's part of the reason why this is such a powerful story. The, the other reason, though, or at least another point that should be given, uh, should give, should be given uh, attention is the intense relational aspect here, Right? I mean, we don't want to get the impression that Jesus was just wandering through a graveyard one day and saying, you know what? I need to show off. Uh, I need to make sure people understand who I am and what I can do. And he's like, he just picks a grave at random and says, we're going to get that dude out of that grave. That's not what happens, right? Jesus has a, a relationship with this family, an intimate relationship with his family. In fact, in John chapter 11, uh, John really goes to great pains to emphasize the fact that, that there is a deep love between Jesus and this family. Uh, in verse 2, John gives us this uh, parenthetical insertion here, this little note, letting us, the reader, know that this family, in particular this Mary, is the same Mary who anointed Jesus uh, with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Right, And we can picture that event where she comes in and she breaks the, the costly uh, nard, the costly ointment, and she begins to pour it on the feet of Jesus and wipe his feet with her hair. And so there's already this kind of backstory between Jesus and this family getting filled in for us where we see that there's this intimate connection. Uh, verse 3, uh, John says that the sisters send word to Christ concerning their brother, telling him, Lord, the one you love is sick. 
Right, this this uh, love that Christ has is confirmed in verse 5 where John writes, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. In verse 11, Jesus refers to Lazarus as our friend Lazarus. And then to top it all off, in John 11, we have, now this is Bible trivia here. You can take this, like if you got to lunch today and you're playing uh, Bible trivia with a waitress, which is, I assume all of us do when we go to lunch, uh, what is the shortest verse in the Bible? And what's well, in John chapter 11, and it's verse 35, and it is? Jesus, Jesus wept. Now, it's easy to keep that within the realm of Bible trivia. It's short, it's pithy, it's two words, but packed in those two words is a massive amount of emotion. A, a, a massive declaration of, of, the, of the connection that Christ had to this family. And that's not to say that he didn't love everybody, but Jesus had a unique relationship with his family, so much so that, that standing there and realizing that Lazarus is dead, even knowing what he's about to do, Jesus weeps. He weeps over his friend who has died. He weeps over this family that is hurting. He weeps for sisters who have lost their brother. So the love that Christ has for this family, I think is part of what makes this event, this moment, this act, so memorable and so impactful. Because it seems at the outset that this intense love that Jesus has for the family is somewhat set in opposition to the decisions that he makes. All right, so if you look at the beginning of chapter, John chapter 11, if you look at me at verses 5 and 6, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now just reading that on the surface, we kind of go, Huh? Like, why did you do that? If Jesus, I mean, if this was like a text message, it would be like the, the, the emoji with the face to the hand, to the head, I mean, the, the palm face emoji. I'm not a very good texter. I'm, I'm just learning how to send emojis and memojis, which are my favorite, because it's a little digital me trapped inside my cell phone. It's fantastic. <laughs> but we read that and we think, why, why does he stay two days longer? Let's imagine just for a moment, somebody you love, somebody you have an intimate relationship with, they're, they're important to you, so much so that the loss of them would cause you to weep. If you found out they were sick and you weren't that far away, what would you do? Well, you'd go to them. You would go to that person. You would want to be with them. I, I was uh, on vacation with my parents uh, in Florida, and I'm, I'm becoming uh, more and more aware of the fact that my parents are aging. They're, they're getting older. Dad doesn't move around like he used to move. He was never much of a mover, let's be honest. I, I love that guy, but he was never much of a mover, but he's not moving like he used to. And you come face to face with the reality that, that I, I'm going to lose my parents someday. It's not going to be, Lord willing, it's not going to be today or it's not going to be tomorrow, but that's, it's coming. That, that, the older I get, invariably, the older they get. And my parents live in Georgia. It's a 16-hour drive one way. Now, if I was called this afternoon, if my mom called me up and said, listen, something's happened. Your father's in the hospital. He had a heart attack. He had a stroke. I'm not going to go, you know what? Whew. <laughs> I'm booked. Uh, I'll see if I can make it down later this weekend, if I can do that. But I just really can't just get. No, I would drop everything. And I would say, my dad is ill. I've got to go. And yet Christ here, he, he, when he hears that he's sick and, 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 and loving them, he, he stays two days longer where he is. Now we know that Jesus' decision here is not really truly set in opposition to his love for this family, but rather is the fullest and most wonderful expression of his love for this family. Because through this illness and through this sickness, Jesus is going to do something unbelievably miraculous. And in doing that, he is going to bring great glory to God the Father through the glorification of the Son and his actions. Now, when Jesus does arrive in Bethany, Lazarus, as you know, is already dead, and he's been in the tomb for four days. And when the sisters hear that Jesus is coming, Martha goes out to meet him. Mary stays at home. Martha runs out to meet Jesus and to speak to Jesus. And it's in this interaction between Jesus and Martha, particularly the words of Martha, that we are confronted again with the certainty, the finality, the, the, just the magnitude of death as it hangs over humanity. 
So look at me at verses 21 through 27 in John chapter 11. Beginning in verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So Jesus, or Martha runs out, rather, to meet Jesus, and she greets him. And now we don't want to read this greeting as if it were a rebuke of Jesus. She's not looking at Jesus and saying, you're late. You should have been here. But rather, Martha is running out to Christ, and in true form, she is confessing her faith. She truly believes that if Jesus had been there, if he had only come earlier, Christ not only would have healed her brother, but would have had the power to heal him, to overcome any illness or any sickness or any disease that had gripped his body. There was nothing impossible for Christ had he come on time. The unshakable nature of her faith is made clear in verse 22. If you look at verse 22 again, she says, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now, some people might read that and think, well, what she's actually saying here is like, look, if you were to ask God to raise Lazarus from the dead right now, he's going to listen to you. He's going to do that. But that seems out of character given the narrative right now, because if we look forward to verse 39, after Jesus has already declared himself to be the resurrection and the life, when they go to the tomb and Jesus tells them to move the stone, Martha protests. She's like, no, don't do that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stink in there. Don't move it. He's been in there for four days. So she's not somehow saying, like, listen, if you were to ask him to be raised, he'd be raised. Rather, what she's doing is even though her, her emotions, her, her heart is broken, right, even though she weeps because Christ didn't come in time to save her brother, her faith in Christ remains firm. She still believes that whatever Jesus asks of God, God will give to him, right? And we, we see that in other places as people are interacting with Jesus. They say, we know you're a teacher from God because nobody could do the things that you do unless God is with him. And so Mary is, I'm sorry, Martha is further confessing her unshakable faith in Jesus Christ. Even though he didn't come on time, even though Lazarus is in the grave, Martha still believes that Jesus is the Christ. Now Jesus' response to Martha here is, I would argue, purposely ambiguous. Look at verse 23. Jesus says, your brother shall rise again. Jesus kind of says this and, and leaves these words open to interpretation. And the way that Martha understands them uh, is as pointing forward to the last day when God's people will experience a bodily resurrection. And, and that's, that's a prevalent belief within Judaism among the Pharisees and among uh, Jesus and his disciples. The Sadducees were kind of the outliers there, right? They didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. We remember when the Sadducees come and try to trap Jesus, they bring this whole uh, divorce and remarriage marriage thing. So this woman's been married seven times, seven dead husbands. Who gets to have her in heaven? And Jesus is like, this is um, Dan Collins' paraphrase, you guys are a bunch of idiots. You don't understand God nor the power of the resurrection. You're, you're doofuses. Um, and so this, this belief in a bodily resurrection was present among uh, Judaism. And so Mary understands Jesus as just kind of, kind of speaking about something that's going to happen. And, and, and it's almost like... Um, it's almost like Jesus is just offering token words of comfort that one should say in such a situation. Right? We, we think about that. If somebody's experiencing loss or if, somebody's a, if we're at a funeral, there's certain things that we know to say, certain things we know not to say, and certain things we know to say. There's words of comfort that we offer. In fact, we could imagine that many of the Jews who came from Jerusalem to comfort Mary and Martha probably said something very similar. They probably looked at her and said, listen, the, the last day is coming, and, and you know he'll be raised again. You know that a, a bodily resurrection is coming. Your, your brother will be raised. And, and so Martha almost takes these again as, as just words of comfort, words that are meant to comfort her and her sister in this difficult time. We see that in verse 24, right? Verse 24, Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. But here's the thing is that Jesus... Uh, loves, loves to use that ambiguity to drive to this deeper truth because Jesus is not referring to some far off distant day in the future, but rather he is speaking of something wonderfully different, namely his very presence there. 
Look at verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus, with these words, tenderly, lovingly, pulls Martha's attention away from some ambiguous, abstract future reality and puts it squarely on himself. Martha, the resurrection is not some future reality to come. The resurrection is me. I am the resurrection in the life, such that there is no resurrection nor life apart from me. This is, this is inexplicable, almost. This is, this, is, uh, this is a metaphysical reality beyond our comprehension. Christ declaring, I am the resurrection and the life. And what we know, even at this point, is that Martha still is struggling with this. Martha still doesn't get this. You see, Martha is is unable to get past what might have been had Jesus come on time. And she's unable to get past what will be in the future. What, What Martha can't see is what's standing right in front of her. What she can't fully take in is the reality that standing in front of her is God in human flesh, the Word incarnate, who is himself the resurrection and the life. And really, we can't blame Martha for this, right? We can't blame her because the truth of the matter is she is just expressing what is the normal human experience. And that is that death is final. Death is that which is not undone. Nobody goes to a funeral expecting the dead person to get up out of the coffin. None of us. Now maybe if you're weird, you go there and you're kind of sitting in the back going, I wonder if it would happen. It'd be kind of awesome if it did. I remember when I was in Greek class in college with Dr. Joel Williams, who might be watching this right now. Dr. Joel Williams, I used to pray in Greek class. I was like, God, you invented Greek? Like, you made that language? Do I really need to sit here? And at the time, please don't take this as an offense, but I lived in Columbia, South Carolina, and Joel Williams was my first exposure to a Midwesterner. And I was like, do I really need to sit here under this Midwesterner and learn Greek, hearing it through this thick accent? And I would pray that God would just bury it deep in my brain. Just put, just make Greek show up, God. He never did. Right? He certainly didn't. I had to labor through that. So imagine somebody sitting in the back of a funeral just going, you know, Lord, it would be awesome if you did this thing. If that guy just got up. We don't do that because we don't expect it because it doesn't happen. Death is final. Death is certain, and death is not undone. And so Mary, in her humanity, we can't blame her. She can't see past the grave. She can't see past the tomb. It's done. And here's the reality. It's good good for us to think about this. That, that, That is the reality, right? Death is certain. Death is final. Death is not undone. And and I would argue that we live in a culture now that is terrified of death. I was uh, perusing the news the other day, and and I often say I read an article, and I realize how much of a lie that is. I read the title, uh, (laughs) then I often don't get past the title. Uh, So I read an article the other day, and it said, uh, if you're not scared as hell of COVID, you should be. And I thought, (laughs) the fear, because we're not used to death anymore, right? Mortality rates are low. We go to the hospital, and when a baby's born, we expect that baby to live. In fact, if the baby's sick or something happens, that's where we freak out, because that's not supposed to happen. The baby's supposed to come out. The baby's supposed to cry. It's covered in some kind of cheesy stuff. They get wiped off. They get handed to mom. They nurse. They grow. They, they age. They bury us. That's how life's supposed to work. It's when it gets flipped around that we freak out. 
I remember when Asher, my, my oldest son, was born. We had had Maddie, perfect birth. We had had Phoebe, perfect birth. We have Asher, the doctor says, oh no. And I said, what do you mean, oh? You don't say, oh no, at a birth? That's like the last word, you don't say that. And Asher was born under extreme or complications. And, and when he was born, he wasn't breathing. When he was born, he was, he was a grayish blue. He wasn't crying, he wasn't making noise. He was handed off to a neonatal team and they're trying to intubate him, trying to get a tube down his throat. And my wife is, is, is saying, why? Is my, why can't I hear my baby? And, and we're sitting there crying and we're praying, Lord, if you're choosing to take our child from us, just give us strength to make it through this. And Because that's not supposed to happen, right? I'm in a hospital. It's, it's 2010. Babies are born and they live. And then we've got technology. We've got promises of defeating death, promises of learning how to manipulate and twist DNA to, to our ends and to our conclusions so that we can reverse aging, we can stop aging. I mean, there's, there's rumors that, that uh, Walt Disney's head is frozen somewhere in, in Disney World just waiting for us to cure death so he can be cryogenically restored. If you're a kid and that freaks you out, I do apologize. It's more of an urban, more of an urban legend than it is actual fact. But the point is, we are not comfortable with death. And yet death does not care if we are comfortable with it or not. It looms over all of us. It looms over all humanity. To, to paraphrase maybe Jonathan Edwards, we walk but on a thin line. At any moment, we could plunge left or right into eternity. And so this, this, this covers Martha's mind. It engulfs her so much so that she can't see what is right in front of her, which is Christ. Christ is the only one who has power over death. Christ is the only one who is the resurrection and the life. And he proves this by marching to that grave and calling Lazarus out of the grave. He not only declares that he is the resurrection and the life, he proves it in his actions by raising Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus is but a foretaste of what is to come. He's, he's an hors d'oeuvre in the feast of Christ's resurrection work. He's a promise of something greater. He's a picture of what is to come for all those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ, death will be undone. And those who are in Christ never die. Death has no power over those who are in Christ. And in Christ, there is hope even in the face of the certainty, the finality, and the fear of death. And so in this interaction with the Jesus whom she loves, Martha learns this intimately. And Jesus is the, the resurrection and the life. Now what Paul does, shifting over to 1 Corinthians 15, what I think Paul does there is Paul unpacks this reality for the church. What it means that Christ is the re resurrection and the life. What it means that, that, that we as those in Christ have hope. So if we look at 1 Corinthians, turn your Bible over to 1 Corinthians what Paul is doing here is he is declaring the hope and the truth of the resurrection as he seeks to correct error within the church at Corinth. Seems that one of the many issues that plagued that congregation was a misunderstanding concerning the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. If we look at verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, that doesn't seem like such a stretch, right? Remember Paul on Areopagus in Athens. The philosophers are listening. The philosophers are going along with him. They, they find this intriguing. And, and what's the breaking point for them? Where, where, do they, where, do they, where do they break off and say, well, this guy's a, a lunatic? So he brings up the resurrection. Why? Because people don't get up from the grave. You die, you die, you don't come back. And so it kind of makes sense that Corinth, a, a city that loves wisdom, a, a city that pays its teachers and sh chooses its teachers well, uh, would find the resurrection of the dead uh, uh, maybe a tough pill to swallow. And so Paul is writing uh, 1 Corinthians 15 to correct this error, to make, them clear, to make sure they understand clearly the truth of the resurrection. And he does this first by highlighting the necessity of the resurrection of Christ to the gospel message. 
In the opening verses of this chapter, Paul refers to the resurrection of Christ as that which is of first importance, along with his death and his burial. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is of first importance such that the gospel would not be the gospel without the resurrection. Now, maybe we don't think about this every day, but we should think about this. That if Christ never was raised from the dead, then we have absolutely no hope whatsoever. Should Christ have lived a perfect life and gone to the cross just as he was purposed to go to the cross and died on the cross just as he did die on the cross, but if he stayed in the grave, it's all for nothing. There is no gospel. There is no forgiveness. There is no hope. Because it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ where the Father declares that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. Paul says this in Romans chapter 1, that it was through the resurrection that God declared in power that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. It is the resurrection, the Father raising the Son from the dead, that is a public, universal uh, declaration of the Father's acceptance of the Son's sacrifice. That the Father has received the work of the Son, that He is pleased in the work of the Son, and that He is extending the forgiveness that the Son has won through the cross. So no resurrection, no gospel. Secondly, Paul assures the church (coughs) of the certainty of the resurrection. That is, Jesus really did get up from the grave. He truly is alive. If we look at verse 20 of chapter 15, Paul writes, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. This is a fact, Paul says. And it's a fact that has been testified and witnessed by other people. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8 with me. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So Paul is sitting here saying, look, Jesus got up from the grave and he showed people he was alive. He went around and he went to Cephas and he went to the other 12. And Paul also reminds the church that what took place, or the resurrection took place as fulfillment of scriptures. The scriptures, the Old Testament promised that Christ would raise, rise from the dead. And in fact, he did rise from the dead. Paul writes that Jesus also appeared to 500 other believers many of whom are still alive. That is, they are still able to testify to what they saw. And lastly, Paul himself is an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the clear point that Paul is making is that the resurrection of Christ does not amount to the ravings, the mad ravings, of a group of disillusioned former followers, but instead it is a true historical fact. Christ is no longer in the grave. And then what Paul does in the end of this chapter, and where I want to give our attention for a few moments, is he fleshes out for the church the hope and the application of the resurrection. See, because I I like to think of it that all of us are standing there before Christ, and Christ is declaring to all of us, I am the resurrection and the life. And the question is, what does that mean for us today? What does that mean as we go out from this place, we eat with families, we engage in this world, and we live our lives? What does that mean? Well, look with me at verses 20 through 23 of chapter 15. Paul writes, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers a kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. So Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. To say that Christ is the first fruits is to say that he is the first of many to follow. He is the first harvest of a larger harvest that is yet to come. That Christ has been raised from the dead means that those who are in Christ will share in his resurrection from the dead. Just as Jesus was raised bodily, so too will his people be raised bodily. Look at verses 35 through 49 of the same chapter. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. 
What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is also one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for the stars differ in star from uh, in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. What is sown in weakness is raised in power. What is sown in a natural body is raised in a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. And as, we, and as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is the hope that Paul puts before the church in correcting their misunderstanding of the resurrection of the dead, that because Christ has been raised from the dead, all those who are in Christ will share in his resurrection. We shall be raised, and not just shall we, not only shall we be raised, but we shall be raised in the fullness of the glory of Christ Jesus. John says it this way in 1 John 3. He says, uh, we are God's children now. Little children, we are God's children now, and what we will be, we do not yet know, but we know this, that when we see him, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. We are going to be sown perishable, but raised imperishable. We're going to be sown in weakness, but raised in power. We're going to be sown a natural body, but raised in this spiritual body. We're going to be like Christ. We're going to bear the image of the man of heaven. As Christ has overcome death and now reigns in glory, so too we shall overcome death in Christ and in Christ reign in glory. Now for one thing, what this does is it completely eradicates any fear we should have of death. We should not be a people of fear. We should not cower in the corner worrying about whether or not our next act is going to lead to our death, but we should boldly go forth declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ, living these kind of radically unhinged lives for the glory of Jesus because we know that nothing can stop us. We know that the great and last enemy, which is death, has been overcome in Christ so that death is not leading to the grave or to judgment, but death is leading to glorification in Christ Jesus. And so we above all people should be fearless. We above all people should live as if we are eternal because we truly are eternal. And Christ Jesus has won this through his resurrection from the dead. He is the resurrection and the life. And all those who live believing in him shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Amen. Amen we believe this. If we didn't believe it, why are we here? It's a beautiful day outside. So it's like, it's going to be 76 degrees, which I think in Minnesota temperature is like 112. (laughs) There are a million things we could do outside right now. And yet we're in here in suits and ties and dresses. Why? Because in Christ, we have hope. Because in Christ, we too shall be raised from the dead. Because we gather together to worship a risen Savior. And because we are in him, we shall share in his resurrection. Lastly, Paul gives the church wonderful application of the resurrection. Look at verse 58. This is one of my favorite verses in all the scriptures. So after 58 verses, 57 verses, 57 verses of of, of correcting uh, an erroneous thought about the resurrection of the dead and and just eloquently, in, in a way that only Paul can, right, just defending the beauty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the necessary nature of it, the certainty of it, the hope that it provides, all of it kind of comes down, boy, 
boils down into this one verse, verse 58. So like all the weight of these 57 verses sits on verse 58, and Paul says, Therefore, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Paul says, be steadfast, immovable, firm, secure, rooted, built up in Christ Jesus because our hope doesn't rest on some mythical belief that some crazy guy got out of the grave, but rather our hope rests in the certainty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, because our hope rests in that, be firm in that, built up in that, immovable in that reality, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Never stopping in the work of the Lord, doing what God has called us to do, declaring the greatness and the glory of Christ who saves. And why? Why? Because we know that nothing we do for the Lord is in vain. It's not useless. It's not purposeless. It's not worthless. But Paul would say in other places that it has an impact on our future reality. It has an impact on eternity yet to come. One of the things that the Bible makes abundantly clear, in fact, in Hebrews chapter 9, is that it is appointed for man once to die, and then comes judgment. Then comes judgment. For those who are not in Christ, judgment is hell. It is eternal punishment. It is receiving in yourself the just punishment for all of your sins. But for those who are in Christ, Christ has taken our punishment. And he is himself our reward, and he promises to his people further rewards for faithfulness. He speaks of crowns of glory and crowns of faithfulness that will be given to his people so that what we do here has an impact on reality, or on on our ultimate reality. I was uh, watching um, Alexander. Oh, shoot. Was it Alexander or, or Gladiator? Now I'm getting my period pieces mixed up. It's one of these things where there's a big army and there's a general in front of the army on a horse. So really you could kind of insert any movie here. It could be a Civil War pick. It could be World War I they used horses. So we got a lot of options here. Uh, it's not necessary that you go hunt down the correct movie. <laughs> but the general is standing before his people. Let's just make it Russell Crowe. Let's make it Gladiator opening scene. And he says to his people, he says, what you do here will echo through eternity. That's, that sounds awesome. That sounds great. And, and, and that might probably, if I was there, I'd probably get jazzed up and be like, all right, let's run in, let's do this. Let's, that's, you got me going, Russell. But what we do does more than echo through eternity in Christ. What we do for the Lord here does more than echo throughout eternity. It has an impact on eternity. It carries over into eternity. It it has a place in our eternity in Christ Jesus. So that he looks at us and he says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into your rest. And the reason we can be good and faithful servants, the reason we can be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, is because Christ Jesus is no longer in the grave. Because he is alive. And he sits at the right hand of the Father and he reigns over all things. And so we, his people, can be fearless and we can charge forward, declaring the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ to all those around us. And I would argue, lastly, just to clarify my words so that I don't, like Russell Crowe, send you out swords ablazing, we can do it in a most beautiful and winsome way, as Christ himself did. We can go out, fearless of all things, declaring the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ, who is no longer in the grave, and calling people to repent and believe and to place their faith, their hope, their trust in him, and share in the joy that we now have in Christ Jesus. We can welcome them into the family, and they can join us steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for what you have done. We come this morning, Father, declaring and recognizing that it was you by your great power who raised your son from the dead. And so, Father, we rejoice, we praise you, and we thank you that you did that. 
We thank you, Father, that Christ was obedient to death, even death on the cross, and that through his death he died, as Paul says, for our sins according to the scriptures, so that your wrath, your wrath was poured upon Christ, so that in Christ Jesus we might become righteousness of God, that we would be forgiven. Father, empower us today, strengthen us today, equip us today to be steadfast, immovable, immovable, and always abounding in every good deed. For your glory and for the glory of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.